As you know, we have a humanities program now. This program is brought to you by the Nebraska Humanities Council, a statewide nonprofit organization cultivating an understanding of our own history and culture with additional funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities, We the People Initiative, and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. If you enjoy this type of programming, please consider supporting the Council with the contributions. Donations are matched by state and federal funds. Your help preserves our past and inform our future. Last year, we invited Jeff Barnes, the humanities speaker. And I want to tell you, you loved him. <laughs> and we were overwhelmed. When I heard that he had a new presentation, I called Jeff right away and asked him if he could be here, and he said yes. So, as He's still, uh, last year, former newspaper reporter and editor, past chairman of the Nebraska Hall of Fame Commission, former marketing director for the Durham Western Museum, and the author of the book, uh, North, Forts of the Northern Plains. Today, he's going to talk about to live and die on the plains. So I present Jeff. Thank you very much. And it must have been a good talk last year because uh, when I spoke, it was Midland College, and after I gave the talk, it became Midland College. I'll share that with <laughs> Okay, well, uh, to tone it down a bit, I'll give you a, a tale of death and doom and despair. <laughs> the book together about the forts, um, of course you can't help but come across tales of, uh, of the Mormon Trail and the Oregon Trail. And Over here? Yeah, I can say. You probably won't be able to get all, but no. you might be able to get some. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, that is kind of... <laughs> Does that work? No, you still have one right above. Yeah, I do. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. We won't, you don't have to take notes, we won't test you. <laughs> oh, but please do fill out the questionnaires. Oh, and the evaluation. The, the evaluation, I mean, because um, it really helps keep the program going, and uh, Frank, I think it's kind of unethical for me to fill those out for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of get a writer's cramp. But, uh, anyway, talking about the, when I was doing the research for the forts, I, you couldn't help but come across stories about... Uh, uh, the Oregon Trail, the Mormon Trail, the California Trail, and the uh, Overland Trail. Uh, you know, they all came by the forts. The forts were built for the protection of those. And then, in the course of doing that, you start to pick up on the stories that were happening along the trail. And, uh, one of the things I found, found was kind of fascinating is what, you know, the many different ways uh, people could, could meet an early demise in trying to get, uh, get across Nebraska. And that's what led to the talk today. Uh, before I really get into that, though, Kind of set the stage and what was happening in America at the time and what was causing all this to happen. But this is a map of the United States in 1845. And from 45 to 50, really a whole semi decade in, in the United States history, uh, tremendous change taking place across the country that uh, had an impact on what I'll talk about today. But essentially, back then, the United States ended right about the Mississippi River line, about that <coughs> way here, about the 50 yard line of the country. Uh, yeah, Missouri, the end of the road is Missouri. We're, we're unorganized out here in Nebraska, and still to some extent, I guess. That's a good thing. Uh, but four major events took place over the next five years that had a tremendous impact on in creating the trails. For one thing, uh, the United States and the United Kingdom resolved their disputes over the Oregon Territory, and that opened up that section of the country for settlement, and that started bringing immigrants through through what's now Nebraska. Uh, we went to war with Mexico and came out on the top side of that, and that opened up the entire uh, southwest portion of the, of the United States for settlement. The Mormons were making their immigration out to the Great Salt Lake. That brought people through our part of the country. And then finally, in 1849, gold was discovered in California, and that brought a tremendous number of people passing through the area. It, it, it really was incredible what we were seeing happening in the United States at that time. 
And uh, give you an example, uh, just by the sheer numbers alone, in 1845, an estimated 5,000 people crossed the Great Plains to get out west. Five years later, an estimated 55,000 were coming through the central part of the United States. And in fact, from uh, 1840 to 1866, an estimated 2.5 million people crossed to get from one side of the country to the other. And this is something that had never, ever been seen in the history of the world where you would have that many people moving for peaceful reasons. When people are moving by the, the thousands and then the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands, it's usually caused by war or disease or pestilence, something like that, driving them away. These are people that were coming of their own free will and volition, looking for free land or instant wealth and freedom of religion. Uh, it, was, it was truly the Great Migration, which was punctuated with great tragedy. Uh, an untold number of people uh, actually died in trying to get from one part of the country to the other part of the country back then. Uh, very many times unexpectedly, uh, they were unprepared for what, was, what they found out here or what was waiting for them. And uh, widows were constantly being cr uh, created, widowers, uh, orphans. Uh, they tell stories about, um, about a young, young man who lost his wife and was left with four kids, and usually had to, you had to adopt them out to other families at that point. Uh, There's another story about uh, a young woman who had five children, uh, the youngest of which was six months old. And what do you do at that point when you're halfway across the country and you've already sold your possessions in your home back home where you came from, and then at that point, uh, what, what do you do? Uh, this is a map of showing the Oregon Trail back then, and you can see this shows where Nebraska is, but an estimated 20,000 people died in the course of the Oregon Trail in trying to get from the Missouri River to the Willamette Valley. Uh, in terms of percentages, that's one out of every 17 that met, uh, met an early demise. And, I don't know, we've got at least 34 in this room, so that means two of us would be gone. Uh, and it was even worse for the Mormons, where they saw uh, at least one out of every 10 uh, perish in, in trying to get from, from the usually Iowa or Missouri, uh, to the Great Salt Lake. So uh, it kind of raises the question, well, what, what was causing this? What was causing this, this tremendous uh, amount of loss of life? Because the 20,000 people in the, the extent of Nebraska, what passes through Nebraska, the extent of what they found disaster in Nebraska, I'd have to imagine at least a fourth of them uh, died in trying to get across the state. And that's why it's sometimes called uh, Interstate 80, a trail of death. You don't realize it when you're passing here. Uh, but there's, a, on average, about 22 unknown burials for every mile that you travel on the other state. Uh, of course, people were buried where they, where they died, generally. And, you know, the Platte River Valley is, without a doubt, Nebraska's log, largest and longest cemetery. Uh, just a tremendous number of people uh, perished here. And, of course, their graves uh, lost for history. Uh, highways going over them, uh, planted fields, homes. Um, everything. Um, so it's just, just, just incredible what, what had actually happened in the state. And uh, of course that begs the question, well what happened? Why were they dying in, in these numbers? By far, the greatest cause of death in crossing Nebraska was by accident. Uh, if, if these people were leaving Westport or St. Joe or Nebraska City or Florence today, OSHA would, uh, would never allow them to leave. <laughs> these things were disasters waiting to happen. And just, a, just a snap of a finger and you, you were gone because of what had happened on, out, to you, out here on the Great Plains uh, in trying to get through this thing. And out of the accidents, by far the greatest cause of accidental death was by accidental shooting. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is an example. This is, I chose this picture because it shows the, the most guns in it, but, but people, when they, when they came out west, they didn't bring a gun, they brought guns. They brought shotguns, rifles, pistols, revolvers, almost just anything they could get their hands on because uh, they were coming into a strange land. Uh, they knew they were going to need firearms for putting meat on the table or on the buckboard or whatever it might be. Uh, they, of course, they knew they were going into Indian territory, and there was a lot of uncertainty about what was waiting for them, so they needed for protection. Uh, and I think uh, people just wanted to have guns, uh, and it was a right time for that because uh, Samuel Colt was going into his mass production at this point. 
uh, other manufacturers were, and guns were being turned out very rapidly and very cheaply. It was very affordable for people to, to buy and own guns. Uh, usually when they had guns, it was passed down to relatives or ancestors that might have been in the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, but this made it possible for them to buy their own gun, not, not use grandfather's gun. Uh, the thing about it, a lot of these um, weapons didn't have the safety features that we have today, and uh, they didn't have the mandatory safety training that we are required to have today. And so they would put them in the, the most unbelievable places. You know, these things would have a hair trigger going on. Uh, you know, stick them in a pocket, just slide them on the buckboard, have them hanging on a nail or, or whatever. And so there were constantly <coughs> discharges of guns going off because the trails were, were bouncing along. Uh, one journal keeper wrote, an immigrant died in their Scots book. His jaw was shot away when a loaded pistol fired from his breast pocket. You know, and they were killing themselves, they were killing family members, they were killing people in the next wagon train. There are countless uh, tombstones along the trails uh, where the inscription read underneath the name of the date of death, shot himself accidentally. It just it was happening constantly because of the, of the gunfire uh, going off on the, on the planes here. Second most ca leading cause of accidental death, death was accidental drowning. You know, when we cross Nebraska today, we don't think anything about crossing the creeks or streams because we've got fantastic bridges. You know, even when we cross the Platte River, if, we, if we're riding shotgun and happen to be reading something, we may not even realize that we've crossed the Platte. But, of course, back then, crossing uh, even the smallest stream was a major undertaking, and one that you always stopped to say a prayer for before you went across. Uh, very uncertain were, were, uh, were the, ri um, excuse me, the river crossings. Uh, you usually had to cock up the wagon to keep uh, the water from seeping in. And if the water was fairly high, there was always a great risk that it would actually turn over the wagon, uh, spilling you and your family and your belongings and sending you down the river. And some of which, including family members, were not recovered. Uh, people, when they came up to the major streams like the, um, like the Little Blue or the Kansas or the South Platte or the Laramie Rivers, uh, they would sometimes go hundreds of miles out of the way to find a suitable crossing. And uh, you want to get there at the right time for that, too. Uh, there's one story about an immigrant who had been riding all day with his wagon, with his family, and just exhausted by the end of the day. They came to a stream, and there was some debate whether they should cross it or not. And they were just too exhausted. They decided to make camp for the night. The following morning, the river, or the stream had risen another four feet. And making it impossible for them to cross. They had to wait another two weeks before it uh, finally lowered enough that they could, could cross the river. And of course you could take a ferry if a ferry was available, but of course these were very, very expensive uh, to, to get your wagons across. These, these were private concerns and they were out to make money for themselves, so they did charge a healthy fee in getting across the, across the stream. But, but even these could spill sometimes. It's just, just a really kind of nippy situation. And, uh, the rivers were just not kind to the immigrants. You could also get crushed by a wagon. Um, of course, these are huge vehicles, um, Conestogos, Prairie Schooners, and starting out initially when they were coming through Kansas and Nebraska, people had a good number of their possessions with them, so that just added to the weight of the wagons. And it was perhaps most unfortunate to the children of the, of the families that were crossing here. Of course, uh, you've got wagons being led by, uh, pulled by oxen and, and mules. They would lurch uh, when you took off, and, came to the sudden stop, that would throw kids off of the wagons. Uh, and sometimes they would also even run, run between the wheels of the wagons. Uh, and that made it very possible for the kids to be crushed by it. Now, for, if they were fortunate enough and the wagons were light enough, they might escape with a broken bone or a you know, broken arm or leg or, or some serious bruising. But usually they were mangled horribly. Uh, and you kind of prayed that they died quickly, but usually they did. It was very, very painful. Uh, sometimes the families would uh, hold up and wait for somebody that had medical training that could set a broken arm or leg. Uh, for adults, it was uh, especially dangerous for the women wearing the long dresses if they got caught in the wagon wheels or men with tail coats or coattails getting caught up in that. That was usually due to fatigue uh, because, you know, thinking about crossing the Great Plains, you're bouncing along and you've got the sun beating down on you and dust being kicked up. And, and you just get plain worn out by riding in a covered wagon for, for the day. And you know, people are usually falling asleep at the wheel or at the reins and, and uh, taking a spill into the wagon. 
just just a horrible, horrible incident. Uh, if you if you did break an arm or leg, if there wasn't anybody there that could set it, if they could tolerate the pain long enough to bounce into Fort Kearney or Fort Laramie, that's where you could get the medical attention. Uh, otherwise, you might have to sit by the side of the road uh, and just wait for the next person that came along that did have medical training and could set that for you. Um, it, it just just was a horrible, horrible situation to be in. Second most leading cause of death was by disease, and uh, these were some of the many diseases that could mean fatality uh, back then. Of course, we don't think about dying from rabies, uh, you know, hydrophobia, mumps, uh, tuberculosis, scarlet fever, measles today. We don't, we don't even think about these things, but these are all very, very deadly diseases back then. Uh, the ironic thing about it was that a lot of these people came from the East Coast, or the large cities, and they were thinking by getting out to the Great Plains, they would have fresh, clean air, uh, clean water, and they'd leave all the you know, filthy air of the cities behind them. Well, people didn't realize back then, but uh, disease is transmitted by uh, bacteria, viruses, uh, germs. They had no concept of germs back then. And when you're traveling in the, as large as these wagon trains were, with hundreds of people in there, you have that many people in close confines. Even if you have clean air, uh, there's still the opportunity for disease to spread very, very rapidly. By far the greatest killer in the Great Plains in 1867, the year Nebraska became a state, was cholera. Uh, this is a drawing of the hold of um, Missouri River Steamboat. All, of, all the people in the hold are suffering from cholera, men, women, and children. I don't have a drawing of what it looked like those suffering on the Great Plains, but probably because it was a very pretty disease to draw. Uh, you know, we hear about cholera today, it usually follows an earthquake or a hurricane in an undeveloped part of the world. Uh, of course, this was the under, undeveloped part of America at the time. And uh, cholera involves the rapid loss of fluids at both ends of the body. There's, there's extreme uh, vomiting, uh, diarrhea, and also accompanied by horrible cramping and extremely high fever. And it's very, very swift acting. You can feel fine in the morning, uh, be completely incapacitated by the afternoon, and by the evening, if you were still conscious, you might see your friends digging your own grave. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how fast it, it struck. Um, this is a handbell for uh, remedies for cholera. And uh, these, these remedies usually didn't work. Uh, the, the best treatment for cholera is the replacement of those fluids just as swiftly as possible by fresh, clean water. And immigrants actually were notoriously filthy people. They would often bathe in and drink wastewater, um, yeah. not knowing that you know, what, what's swimming around in it, actually. And uh, actually just made their situation worse by, uh, by doing that. Just, just a horrible, horrible uh, end. Uh, next greatest cause of death, and this is particularly bad for the Plains Indians, was smallpox. Uh, smallpox, we don't think much about today. Uh, we've all got our little inoculations on our phone and kids. And, and uh, it's officially been eradicated from the, uh, from the world by the, the United Nations reports. But back then, it was a very real, very feared disease. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever seen smallpox before, but this is, this is one of the more shocking photos I got. But this is, this oh is what smallpox God. looks like. Uh, this is a small Indian child, and it is horrible, disfiguring pustules across the entirety of the body. Uh, it's accompanied by very painful uh, also with the cramping, very high fever. If you are able to survive the smallpox, you of course left with horrible scars for the rest of your life. Uh, there's a story of the, of the Mandan chief, Two Bears. His, uh, he was a, a Mandan, he was, uh, started out as a great friend of the whites that were coming in. He was all for trading and, and accommodations until smallpox hit his family. And he knew that this, that the, the white settlers had brought this to him and wiped out his family completely. He contracted it himself and uh, survived it, and he didn't feel favored for that. In fact, he said, uh, you know, they didn't bother, didn't need to bother to bury him when he died because he was so horrible looking that even the wolves wouldn't eat him. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how devastating it was. And all of the diseases were like that. Uh, by far, even more than the Indian Wars, the greatest threat uh, to the Indian tribes of the Great Plains was depopulation by disease. Uh, 1800, when the United States first started having contact with the Indians, there were an estimated 600,000 Indians on the Great Plains. 
by the end of the century, it was down to 250,000, mm -hmm. largely caused by, by disease. And, you know, this had a number of detrimental effects in the relations between whites and Indians. Uh, for one thing, uh, it wiped out a great number of the population, and the, the kind of numbers that they needed to resist the white settlement that was coming in. It was also very hard on the tribal leaders, the elderly people of the tribes, and the, the tribes relied on these elderly for, for, the, for their experience uh, to get them through situations like this. And it created a great amount of distrust between the Indian tribes and the white people. Of course, the Indians knew that the, uh, the whites had brought these diseases to them and, and distrusted them forever because of that. And the white population saw this as another example of an inferior race that was destined to be replaced by a superior one. So that just exacerbated the situation uh, through disease. Um, other causes of death on the plane, of course, there's always a great fear about animals. They were seeing animals that they'd never seen before. I mean, immense buffalo herds, uh, wolves, uh, mountain lions rattlesnakes, uh, just all kinds of strange creatures that were new to them. And of course, there was, there, there was a fear that uh, these animals couldn't bring them down. They actually really didn't. Uh, if, if they were killed by a buffalo, it was usually some foolhardy hunter that got too close to a, to a buffalo to shoot and missed the shot and took, took the horns instead. If you were going to be killed by an animal on the Great Plains, it was likely because of animals that you had brought yourself. Uh, horse herds, cattle herds. Uh, you got into a stampede and started trying to control them, there's a good uh, chance that you might be crushed by those. Uh, if you got kicked in the head with a, by a mule, something like that, or if you, your horse stopped, startled and rolled and crushed you underneath them. That was by far the greatest uh, risk of, of being killed by animals on the Great Plains. Uh, nature was a very, very great fear. Uh, this is a drawing of a man trying to control his, uh, his horse team in the wagon uh, with a prairie storm approaching. Uh, people were seeing things that they had never seen out of nature before in coming to Nebraska. Uh, the thing about the where was it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But of course, they didn't have storm shelters or anything like that. And, and, and you know, wide open spaces with, with no buildings, nothing to block, block the horizon, uh, really not a lot of trees either. They were seeing things that were caused by where we are in the, in the country today. Of course, we got the warm-up drafts from the Gulf and the cold winds coming down from Canada and the, and the high winds coming across the Rocky Mountains. And it just creates a perfect kind of storm cauldron here. Uh, and, and, you know, if you're out on the plains and you start to see clouds boiling up on the horizon and getting larger and larger and larger and the huge bolts of lightning, you, see, you start to get terrified by, oh no, what that got brought. <laughs> here, here it comes the end of times. But, um, one journal keeper wrote, uh, one experience in life in the Great Plains, it rained in hail, as it does in no other place in the United States. And one man wrote back to his mother in Indiana, says, you think it rains in Indiana, but if you want to see a storm, come to the plant. <laughs> it was terrifying what they were seeing. Uh, of course, one of the bigger, biggest things that sh shocked them was hail. Uh, this is a drawing of a hailstorm over the, uh, the North Platte River. And of course, these people are terrified by what they're seeing with the huge clouds and the lightning there. Uh, I don't think we hold it now, but Nebraska traditionally holds the record for the largest hailstones in the country, uh, you know, about the size of a melon sometimes. <laughs> and uh, that was the kind of things people were seeing crossing the Great Plains. Of course, when these hailstorms started, they took cover underneath their wagons. Well, of course, that leaves the, leaves the, the oxen team and the mules to take the damage. Hopefully, they're not going to stampede after, after that happens. Uh, when they tried to get cover, because of course there weren't any buildings, uh, very, very few trees, they would try to use pots, skillets, that kind of thing as cover for their heads, um, which usually resulted in broken knuckles because of the, of the hailstones hitting them. A lot of bloody faces uh, because of the hailstones. I, I couldn't find any record of anybody being killed by hail, but uh, there was one recorded uh, miscarriage as a result of, of being caught in a hailstorm. Lightning. Uh, this is a tombstone out at uh, Fort McPherson. Uh, reads, killed by lightning at Fort Laramie, Wyoming Territory, May 25th, 1881. Uh, this was a private uh, at Fort Laramie. When, when Fort Laramie was closed, the, the graves that were there were disinterred, reinterred at Fort McPherson <coughs> National Cemetery. But he was one of thousands of people that were actually killed by, by uh, lightning across the plains. Uh, men, women, children, of course, is indiscriminate. 
And back then, there were no TV towers. There were no uh, you know, lightning rods on top of skyscrapers. You were out on the plains. Uh, if you were on horseback or on foot or on a wagon, there were no trees about. You might be the largest target or the highest target around. And you took the you took the lightning bolts. And there are many, many instances of, of tombstones along the trail uh, with, with the same inscription, killed by lightning. Flooding. Um, of course, when you when you camped at night, you wanted to be alongside a stream because you need the water for cooking and cleaning and that sort of thing. This is a photograph of George Custer and his wife Libby camped on Big Creek in Kansas. Uh, this was one of Custer's military camps, and uh, fortunately for him, he was off on campaign when this next incident happened. But before he left on campaign, he made sure that Libby was on the highest ground around. Of course, this is Kansas, there's not a lot of high ground. <laughs> she got on a nice little berm uh, near the creek. Unfortunately for her and the rest of the camp, uh, there had been a big storm further upstream from, from uh, her camp on the big creek. Uh, the storm, the washout from the storm, came down to the creek during the night and rose seven feet within three hours. <laughs> of course, this is nighttime with a, with a moonless night, and they didn't hear any storm coming through until it finally woke them up uh, just about four o'clock in the morning. And then, of course, looking out their tent door, tent flap, and between flashes of lightning, seeing soldiers being washed down the creek. Uh, six soldiers were killed by, by the flooding here. And of course, she being on higher ground, was able to survive that, but it was just a tremendous thing. And that's what happens with the, with the streams out here. Uh, most of them, for the largest part of the year, they cover a very uh, small amount of water. But if you get one of those flash floods, it just wipes out everything there. And that caught a lot of the emigrants off guard as well especially those that, you know, of course, have camped close to the, to the stream beds. Then winter. Uh, this, is a, this is a drawing of a Mormon trail, a hand cart train, uh, getting caught by a blizzard out in, in Wyoming in October. Of course, we've all lived long enough in Nebraska. We've seen, we've seen blizzards in April, and we've seen blizzards in October. We've even seen snow sometimes as, as uh, late as June and as early as September. And that was one of the things about being on the Great Plains. You never knew when you would get something like this. And, and these folks, these poor folks were caught off guard. Uh, one German keeper had written, each day the weather grew colder and many were frostbitten, losing fingers, toes, or ears. 15 people were buried, 13 of them frozen to death. I mean, where do you go? There's no shelter for this. The only thing you can do is to keep moving. And it, it just had to have been excruciatingly horrible. It just it's just, it's just impossible to, to contemplate something like that. And you didn't even have to be on the trail for it to, to be the victim of winter as well. This is a painting of winter quarters, what's now Florence, uh, Nebraska, the north part of Omaha, alongside the Missouri River there. And you can see all the cabins scattered across the, across the valley there. Uh, you know, even if you had a roof over your head, uh, you were still subject, subjected to the, to the horrible cold and sometimes wetness of winter. Uh, but they were suffering from uh, uh, malnutrition and disease as well. An estimated 360 Mormons died in, in the course of, of being camped out here in the uh, north part of Omaha. And that leads to something I want, wanted to tell you also about as well as burial on the plains and how people's attitudes changed over the course of time as they, as they went further down the trail. Now when they left Westport and the first death started to occur, it was kind of treated typically as it would have been treated back home. Uh, the train was held up for services, you know, proper burial was, uh, site was found, and the coffin was, was, uh, was procured, and uh, services were held. By the time they were getting into Nebraska, attitudes were really starting to change about that. Of course, they knew they only had a limited amount of time to get there to where they were going before the, the weather really started to turn poorly, so the trains were not holding up for one, one death. They would, most of them would keep going, so that left the family to provide. Uh, what, wood was starting to become scarce, so they weren't building coffins. Uh, of course, with the, with the time frame involved, uh, the graves weren't being dug as deeply. <laughs> uh, the services weren't as long. Uh, you know, people, when they're buried, at this point, usually uh, wrapped up in a family quilt or blankets or something like that, and buried in a shallow grave. Uh, and attitudes really started to change about that too. Uh, people that originally started out with great sorrow for what had happened, then there became almost indifference to it, and then finally almost uh, 
became almost humorous for some. Uh, that one journal keeper had written about some immigrants who had found an exposed human skull and were using it for target practice. Mm. That's how different they were to, to death at that point. Uh, just truly, truly tragic. And that's what you know led to the popularity of the song and the verse. It matters not, I've been told, where the body lies when the heart grows cold. Yet grant, oh grant this wish to me, oh bury me not on the lone prairie. <laughs> for, for many people, I mean, you know, fate almost worse than death was having to be buried out on the prairie because there wouldn't be any family member to take care of you. Uh, there was always a great fear of, of Indians marauding your graves, which was very real until Indians realized that a lot of people were dying of cholera, so <laughs> you know, the bodies alone at that point. Uh, but there's also you know, wolves and coyotes who would naturally dig up graves. And so you just, you just prayed if you were going to die, you made it to Oregon or to, or to Salt Lake City where you could be with your family and, and be, uh, have your grave taken care of at that point because you, you didn't want to be by yourself out on the, out on the prairie. Uh, back to causes of death, Indian attack. Uh, initially, when the, when the immigrants started coming through, uh, the Indians kind of kept the hands off. They were more curious than anything and would just kind of watch the, the, the trains passing through. As they grew bolder, they started to approach the, the wagon trains and, you know, even bartering for passage. Uh, you know, coffee, sugar, bacon, clothing, that sort of thing. So kind of acting as toll, toll collectors. That started to change greatly in the 1860s when the Civil War broke out. And the regular troops that were on the, on the plains uh, got sent back east to fight in the wars. That uh, made it possible for the Indian tribes to start counterattacking the trains coming through. Uh, of course, the buffalo had been driven away by this point. The whites were coming in greater and greater numbers. Uh, treaties had been broken. And the, the Plains Indian realized this is their last chance to get back what had been theirs. And so attacks started coming fairly frequently on the Plains, especially in Nebraska in 1864 and 65. In fact, uh, the Platte River Valley, outside of the Civil War states, was probably the most dangerous and deadly uh, area in the country at that point. Uh, particularly subject to attack were shippers that were coming through. They were carrying a good number of the, of the goods that the Plains Indians wanted, and they traveled in smaller numbers. The, the wagon trains tended to travel in large groups. Uh, in fact, the, the United States Fort Kearney wouldn't allow wagons to pass unless they had at least 100 in the train uh, because Indians weren't going to attack large numbers of uh, wagons. And I told you, they all had you know, practically to the rafters with guns, so <laughs> they were going to stay away from those. So the, so the shippers generally got the, got the worst of the attacks. Uh, this is a painting which likely will never happen. Uh, of course, this is the kind of thing that we remember from our childhood, seeing in, in movies or TV shows. Indians did not attack forts. Uh, it happened a couple times, and it didn't happen where they had stockaded walls around it. Uh, Indians didn't like to attack where there were lots of people with lots of guns. And for the most part, the forts of the time didn't have these stockaded walls. There were only about two or three incidences of that. Uh, wood being such a precious commodity, you weren't going to waste time uh, putting uh, stockade walls up, especially if you could see the Indians coming from miles away. So that, this kind of thing didn't happen. When Indians were attacking soldiers, it was usually because they were able to catch them off guard. Uh, this, is a, this is a painting of the so-called Fetterman Massacre in, in Wyoming. What had happened here was a small group of Indians were taunting uh, the soldiers in Fort Phil Kearney. They sent out a party of about 80 soldiers headed by Captain William Fetterman to pursue these Indians. They went over the ridge and were met by another 2,000 Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho. So 2,000 against 80, you're, you're not going to have any survivors. And that's, that's what had happened with, uh, with the Fetterman Massacre. Uh, usually, they would, if they were going to be killing uh, soldiers, it usually involved catching small, much smaller groups of 80 off guard. And the next photograph here is by far the most, the most shocking thing you'll see here today. But this is uh, Sergeant William Williams of the 7th Cavalry who got separated from his group in, in Kansas. And uh, I'm sure he didn't live too long to, because they were very much into torturing uh, these soldiers, if they were able to catch them, uh, they know from the Indian, uh, from the arrows, the the felching on that, came from probably six different tribes involved here, and you can tell that from the cuts. I mean, the Sioux made made cuts 
you know, usually with the chest, something like that, the shine would make slashes on the thighs. The Arapaho would, would cut off nose tips, that kind of thing. So they each left calling cards on, on this kind of thing. And, uh, you know, for like the, uh, the Kidder Massacre, which, uh, which uh, happened up in northwest Kansas, then George Custer came across, uh, those men had been tortured for a great deal of time, uh, fire, everything. Uh, just, you couldn't even recognize the bodies, really, by the time they were found. And that leads into the real exciting part of the show, <laughs> the massacres. <laughs> uh, massacre was a term that got used very, very frequently in the, uh, the popular newspapers of the day. Uh, probably overused, but there were examples where you could definitely say this was a massacre that had happened here. And the kind of ironic thing about it is it was very, oh, kind of an equal opportunity crime. I mean, uh, Indians were massacring whites, whites were massacring Indians, Indians were massacring Indians, and whites were massacring whites. And that's kind of what you had up here in the, in the Great Plains. You, I mean, this was a large area with not, you know, they didn't have radio, television, newspapers, that kind of thing. There wasn't communication which kind of binds everybody together and makes sure they're all on the same page. These are people who came from very different cultures, very different beliefs, very different experiences, and Sometimes uh, the situation got so bad that massacres would erupt. I'll start with uh, the Dakota uprising in Minnesota. What had happened here, uh, again, with the, with the treaties being broken for the Sioux that were in the state, uh, they were supposed to have been getting annuities, which included food in 1862. Bills weren't coming through, a lot of bureaucratic uh, hijinks going on. And uh, unfortunately for the Sioux, they were also going through a famine at the time. And uh, that leads, of course, to some empty bellies make angry heads. And it uh, and, uh, started out with a small attack at a, at a kind of a remote homestead, farmstead out in the country, and erupted across the entire state. Uh, before it was over, 800 white settlers were killed uh, during the Dakota uprising. This is a painting of the attack on the village of New Ulm. I uh, was attacked twice, uh, twice there. Uh, an untold number of Indians were killed in the uh, in the uprising. Uh, eventually, the uh, the federal troops were, came back into Minnesota and were able to reestablish control, which ultimately ended with 300 Indians being sentenced to hang. Uh, President Lincoln commuted that down to 38, just those that uh, were proven to have been uh, murderers and rapists during the uprising and 38 were executed in Mankato, Kansas, uh, hung on the public square there. Uh, Sand Creek, two years later in Colorado, was kind of a reversal of that. Uh, the 3rd Colorado Cavalry out of Denver was hired on a, on a three month period for the, uh, kind of to control the attacks that had been happening in Colorado. They had not seen any action during most of this period and were starting to be called the Bloodless Third as a joke by the, by the residents of the territory. Uh, they, unfortunately for the Cheyenne Village, uh, the Third Colorado found them on the Sand Creek. And even though this was a peaceful village, you can see the American flag there, even though this was a peaceful village, uh, they began an attack on it. Uh, the village sent out a small girl waving a white flag to indicate that they were peaceful. She was immediately shot. Uh, and about 38 braves were killed, but about 100 men and children, excuse me, about 100 women and children were killed in the attack. And it was just brutal by the, uh, by the third Colorado. They started uh, killing indiscriminately, killing children, uh, women, uh, the bodies of the women were molested, you know, hacked off parts, uh, cut off as souvenirs from the troops. Uh, they were called the Bloody Third after that, and unfortunately, their term ex expired before any of them were able to be brought to trial for this, including the commander, uh, Colonel Shivington. It was just, just one of the outrageous incidents of American history. And, and the thing about it is, they may have thought they were doing a good deed, but by this attack on, the, on this peaceful village, it just inflamed the flames for the next seven years. Uh, of course, word gets around what had been done by the blue coats. And attacks were, were coming very, very frequently on the Great Plains because of that. Nobody could have got among the Indian tribes that happened there. Massacre Canyon, this is a Nebraska site. 
Uh, what had happened here in 1873 was a group of Pawnee from their reservation in central Nebraska were hunting buffalo in the southwest part of the state. And uh, this is still, you know, Nebraska was a state for five, six years at this point. Uh, this part of the state had not been settled yet. But they found a herd of buffalo and were uh, doing a buffalo hunt in the canyon here. And in a horrible bureaucratic mix-up, uh, the United States was also allowing the Sioux to hunt them in the same area at the same time. Uh, the Sioux and the Pawnee were lifelong enemies. And for the, uh, for the 350 Pawnee that were discovered by the 1,000 Sioux, <laughs> as they came over the, over the hill there, for the Sioux, it was kind of like Christmas morning. They just said, here's our enemies. Let's go to town. And, and the attack, just ruthless, just absolutely indiscriminate killing. Uh, not only men, but there, of course on the hunting part, there's a large number of elderly and women and children that came along to help with the work as well. So uh, this is a true decimation. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a tenth of the, of the tribe that were lost here. Finally rescued by the 5th uh, Cavalry out of Fort McPherson, who were on patrol in the area, and were able to drive off the Sioux. But uh, this is the last draw for the Pawnee in Nebraska. As a result of this, uh, they gave up the reservation of the state and moved to Indian Territory, what's now Oklahoma. Where is that? That's, uh, that's down by uh, uh, Trenton. Right. Yeah, I've got another photograph that shows you what's there today, too. But, uh, and then finally, uh, the Mountain Meadows Massacre. This is where you get into a situation where even though the people are the same race and speak the same language and supposedly share many of the same values, it can still go horribly awry. Uh, what happened here in 1857, a large uh, immigrant party from Arkansas was moving out to California. And they were fairly well supplied, uh, had all the cattle they needed, but even in the course of, of traveling across the country, you still make trades along the way to survive and you know, get the things that you need. They were passing through the Utah Territory and were expecting to make a lot of trades then, you know, trading cattle for fresh fruits and vegetables, that sort of thing. Unfortunately for them, they were passing through the territory the same time that the United States was strongly contemplating going to war with the Mormons out of Utah. Uh, Utah was, uh, the, the residents, the Mormons there were still continuing their polygamous ways. Uh, there was a lot of mistrust uh, and hatred for her around the United States for that. Uh, some other things had exacerbated the situation and there's actually uh, planning to move troops from the United States into Utah to, su to suppress the Mormons and to put in their own uh, federal government to run the territory. Of course, this kind of thing that, you know, hearsay and innuendo and tales and everything, that starts building up um, in the territory. And for some of the leaders, uh, that was the opportunity to fortify their position and really get people fired up about anybody coming into the Utah Territory. And that was unfortunately for the Panther Party when they came through Utah. Uh, they got to Salt Lake City and found that the windows pretty much boarded up. Nobody was going to speak with them, trade with them, or anything because there's always a great fear of excommunication if you did help anybody that was passing through. Uh, so they did, they, they barely eked it out through the territory and thought as soon as they get out of Utah, then they can start uh, you know, doing the trades and surviving and getting through. Unfortunately, before they got out, uh, they were attacked by what initially appeared to be Paiute Indians, uh, but soon came to the realization that these were Mormon extremists that were attacking them. Uh, these were people that were not going to allow them to pass through any means. And uh, they held them off for quite a few days until finally one of the leaders of the, of the Mormon extremists identified himself, came out, promised that he knew these people, that he would drive them away, but the people would have to leave their belongings behind, you know, lose their guns. That went on for a couple of days until finally they agreed, all right, just get us out of here. And they were going to peacefully escort them from their wagons and out, out of the territory. About a mile from the uh, from where they left their wagons, uh, extremists up in the hills surrounding them opened fire and killed everybody over the age of nine. I mean, men, women, and children, execution style killings, uh, just indiscriminate. And the thinking was anybody under nine would not remember this. Uh, the children were going to be adopted into families uh, and hopefully just grow up and this, not, nobody would ever hear word about this. Well, of course, word did spread, and especially you know, even among the Mormon community. A lot of people, when they heard what had happened here, 
immediately left the church, left the, left the territory, went back to where they had come from. Uh, they were able to suppress us for a number of years, and it was finally, you know, no trials were actually ever held, uh, except for one person, John Lee, the person who had convinced the people to lay down their arms. He was eventually executed. This is more than 20 years after the incident happened. He was the only one ever punished for that. And it's still, of course, not discussed very much. There's, a, there's an excellent book called American Massacre that just tells the story. It's, it's just incredible. And something that would have happened like that in, in the United States at the time. Just, just astounding. And then in closing, I'm going to do a little in memoriam of what you can find along the trail today for, uh, for those who did, did pass on. Uh, starting in Omaha, of course, in Florence, there's the Mormon Pioneer Cemetery. Uh, this is actually on the burial ground for the winter quarters. And there are only about four or five graves that are actually identified. Most of the graves are long, long gone. So the people that died in winter quarters are commemorated in this large, uh, large monument to their, to their uh, experience there. Uh, this photograph I actually took just uh, two days ago. This is, this is kind of neat. Uh, I've wanted to see this for quite some time, but this is the Susan Hale grave. And you see I've got spelled Hale with an E there, and that's what the historic plaque here says on her grave. It's spelled without an E. And there's another spelling, H-A-L-E. So there's, <laughs> there's some mystery and uh, confusion involved in this. But Susan Hale uh, was a young woman, 34, uh, died in 1852. And at the time, it was reported she had died uh, by drinking from a well that had been poisoned by Indians. And it's not known if that's true or not. The historical plaque that's at the grave now says it's from cholera. It says she died within an hour after drinking from the well. Uh, but the tombstone there that went up uh, said that she was killed by drinking poison water uh, from a well poisoned by Indians. Uh, this is not the original tombstone. Uh, the, the word is, the legend is, is that her distraught husband, this is just uh, northwest of Hastings, uh, her distraught husband sent his family on board and returned to St. Joe, and then some people say he went to Omaha, <laughs> but returned to St. Joe and got a headstone for his wife and brought it back uh, through a wheelbarrow. So pushed it all the way back from Westport, Missouri with a wheelbarrow and erected it. And of course that became kind of a landmark for those passing along on the Oregon Trail. And unfortunately, you know, the immigrants coming through said, oh, this is so touching. I gotta get a souvenir of this and chip off a little piece of it. Until the, five, the first tombstone was completely gone. Uh, I, I can't remember if there was a second one put up. This might be the second or third tombstone that was actually to commemorate uh, Susan Hale. Uh, further along the trail is for the first of National Cemetery. Uh, the thing about the, the National Cemetery is they live on when the forts don't. And as forts closed up around the Great Plains, the soldiers that were buried there, uh, their bodies were disinterred and then reinterred at Fort McPherson. So there's, there's about 20 different forts represented here. And take some time to look around among the tombstones, especially in the older section of the cemetery, because they've got very interesting tales. You know, not just killed by lightning, but uh, this person was assassinated and <laughs> murdered and, and all kinds of uh, interesting little <laughs> early demises. Uh, the Rachel Pattison grave at Ash Hollow, I don't know, many of you may have, may have visited this already, but uh, Rachel Pattison was a very young woman, 18, 18 years old, uh, had just been married, two months married, and had sold off her possession with her, with her husband, came out west and died of, uh, died of cholera at the Ash Hollow site. And uh, very, very tragic. And she's one of the first burials here. This is her original tombstone, which is kind of protected with the historical plaque there, the Oregon Trail marker and, and uh, well, the historical plaque, which tells the entire story of her there. What year This was in, uh, oh, I'm getting late again. <laughs> there we go. Uh, I believe this was in 52, I think. You know, I just replaced the slide this morning and I had a photograph of this. I could have told you in an instant. <laughs> I was going to hold you here. <laughs> but I believe it was 52. No way, I think that. Because I remember the, the four was backward on 1847. The four was backward? Yeah, they had chiseled into the stone that the four was backwards going. <laughs> 
Ask. You didn't have to be a college professor. <laughs> 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 uh, and then Rebecca Winter, she was with the uh, with the Mormon Trail, and she was uh, she died in I think she's the one that died in '52. But when she had died, she had also died in college. It's kind of interesting that the uh, the three graves in Nebraska, three women, all three died in college. I, I don't have any instances of pioneer immigrant males whose graves were found. But anyway, when she had died, her grave was marked by uh, two semi rims from uh, from a wagon wheel, the iron rims, and they used that to mark the grave. When the Burlington Railroad came through here and started laying down track, they found that grave, you know, with the two iron rims across it. And this is where the track originally stood. It was destined or planned to come right through there, but when they found the grave, and because it was identified, they shifted the, the track over to the side so so it didn't travel. You know, yeah. most graves track just went right over. There was no way of knowing that. And eventually, of course, the Burlington did raise the track, and so there's just a small section of it here to mark it. But of course, there's a state historical marker. Uh, the grave is very well marked now. A little historical display and everything. This is just right outside the uh, Scott's Bluff, you can see the bluff in the background there, just to the south of Gary a little bit. And then finally, uh, this is the Massacre Canyon site today. Uh, there's a nice little wayside museum and gift shop, uh, the Trenton Chamber of Commerce puts on. And uh, the marker here, the, the actual Massacre Canyon is back over this hill here. Uh, this, this granite obelisk, it used to be in the old section of the highway which is over here, but when the highway got moved, they picked up everything, and moved, including that, and moved it, moved it over here. Can't miss a tourism opportunity, so <laughs> gotta make it convenient for people. But, uh, it's really neat, really neat little site. Where's Trenton? It's in the southwest corner of the state. It's about 20 miles west of McCook, along Highway 34. <laughs> And uh, that's the tale of to live and die on the plains. Uh, you know, I, I've told you some pretty, pretty gruesome stories here today. I, I think you knew what you were in for, though. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I hate to leave leave on a less than positive note because you know I mentioned that um, you know one out of 17 from the Oregon Trail had died, one out of 10 from the Oregon from the Mormon Trail had died. Well, that meant 16 out of 17 made it. You know, nine out of 10 on the Mormon Trail made it. So. Uh, you know, fairly hard to stop, but but in either event, you know, these people were really, really incredible, incredible folks. I mean, willing to give up everything, you know, for a chance of uncertainty. Uh, you know, it's just you you, you did not know what you were going to find on the great plains, um, and they were usually shocked by what they did find. But, but these were really incredible people. You know, whether they lived or died, I, I I'm really impressed and proud that uh, you know. What, much of what they experienced happened here in Nebraska. As a Nebraska history nut, I'm pretty, pretty proud of that. As, as fellow Nebraska history nuts, I hope you are too. Thank you very, very much. Miles off the off the trail to, to find uh, find any game, game of any kind. I had I had an ancestor. This is my great great grandfather. His name was Alpheus Napoleon Barnes. I don't know <laughs> You can tell who his dad was inspired by. But uh, he was a hunter for two wagon trains, and I know that from his newspaper obituary. And I I'd love to know which time and you know how far he went. I mean, doing two wagon trains that's that's a heck of a ride. Uh, I imagine mean, his work was really cut out for him. How'd he die? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I think he got just way too old. <laughs> <laughs> he made two wagon trains. We were pretty tough on the bird. Is there evidence of um, what they found along the way as far as uh, flora? You know, like plants and, you know, um, yeah, vegetation. Sure there is. Um, I know, well, like the Susan Hale grave, I know just before she had died, there was uh, you know, three of their oxen had been lost from eating poisonous weed or something. Uh -huh. 
Uh, so I knew they figured out fairly quickly what was good to eat, what was not good to eat. Uh, but to tell you the truth, I haven't, I haven't looked into that a lot. Good question. <laughs> I don't know. I know that there are weeds that could kill you, though. <laughs> but I just wondered if they found, like, berries oh, and, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm and yeah. other, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Other ways to survive <laughs> besides <laughs> the meat. <laughs> you know, I haven't really looked into that, but, I mean, I can see easily, you know, where people would come to well, I think that back there was one, uh, one officer when Custer came into Nebraska the first time. Uh, White, White Cliff Cooper was his name. Uh, a lot of times, if you're an alcoholic, uh, you can lead into some kind of delirium. And uh, he actually shot himself in a drunken delirium. Delirium, I think they call it. But he just went so nuts when he was drinking that he actually killed himself. And I don't think it's because he's in Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions? Yeah. yeah. When they were um, constructing the highways across Nebraska, did they find these graves, like going across the interstate or Highway 30? I'm sure they had. Them. I haven't, you know, I, I haven't looked into you know, the 50s and 60s mm -hmm. when they started building the interstate. Mm -hmm. I, I'm certain they did. I mean, a lot of times I think they probably think they were Indian graves, but I mean, they probably kept thinking of white graves as well because they really weren't burying them that deeply. Yeah, and so and if, the, if the animals or just nature itself had exposed the graves, I'm sure they gathered them when they were, when they were plowing through there. And it's, you know, I kind of wonder sometimes if they would even bother to say anything. <laughs> they did. Yeah. Yeah. Are you researching something now? Uh, researching now. Well, the next book comes out in December. Okay. If, if you like, I've got a preview of the next one, a little bit of that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Okay. This, one, this one's really, really fun. Uh, well, the next book is called The Great Plains Guide to Custer. It's going to be the first travel guide to all of the spots that Custer visited on the Great Plains. And I, I was a little apprehensive about Nebraska because I thought, well, there's not going to be a lot that he did in Nebraska, but I was astounded when I started digging in. Uh, you know, everybody knows about Custer's last stand. Custer's first stand was in Nebraska. I mean, his very first battle with Indians was in Nebraska. And of course, this is where he did the great buffalo hunt with uh, Grand Duke Alexis and Phil Sheridan and Buffalo Bill Cody. He spent, you know, maybe about a month in the state total in two visits. But the things that he did, especially the tour that he took of Omaha uh, in 1872, is kind of a chamber of commerce tour, but there's really exciting things happening in the city back then. And, and he went to see them all, so I'm really excited about that. But this is, this is one of the things that I had to do, uh, was, to, was to hike up the mountain Indian Terra. George Custer was right up there, and I had to walk in his footsteps for the book because I said, you know, I want to go where Custer went. I want to show people where Custer went, so I got to climb to this mountain, and that was Indian Care. Now, Indian Care is located as part of the Black Hills, but it's it's actually outside of uh, the South Dakota part, the main part. It's in Wyoming, and of course, George Custer came down here with the Seventh Cavalry in 1874. Uh, they were looking for a site to build a fort, but also wanted to check out the rumors of gold in the Black Hills. Mm -hmm. And so they came down to Fort Abraham Lincoln, passed this way, and decided to climb Indian Cara because that kind of acted as a kind of the highest observation point for the Black Hills. They, they, they were looking for an entrance to the Black Hills. It's always you know, legendary. They knew it was Indian territory, uh, but it was kind of a fortress. There wasn't an easy easily recognizable passage into the Black Hills, and so he went to get the high ground to, to try to find that. And of course, I wanted to, wanted to see the site as well. Um, I'm going to start off. This is, this is my buddy, Randy. Um, when I go out on my road trips, if I'm going to like a state park or a historic festival, I bring my wife. If I'm going out for research or to take photographs, I go by myself usually. If I'm going someplace where I might break a leg and get sick, <laughs> that's when Randy comes along. <laughs> but the, the thing about Indian Care, it's, a, it's publicly held. It's part of the Forest Service. 
but all the land surrounding it is privately held. It's all private ranches there. So you have to check in with the Forest Service office in Sundance, Wyoming, and they'll tip you off about who's okay with you parking on their land, and so you can make the hike. So we found a very nice couple willing to help us, and this is at the start out of our hike. And he's suggestion for where our approach is going to be. Uh, we're going to go up this grassy slope and uh, get up on the thing here. The thing I tell you about the Indian carrots, it's the Indians described it as a mountain within a mountain. It's really it's part of the the big three mountains that uh, the Indians held held holy: uh, Devil's Tower, Bear Butte, and the Black Hills, and then Indian Carrot is the third one. But it's described as a mountain within a mountain because the outside rim is kind of horseshoe shaped. And then you got to get up on that rim, and then inside that is the peak for the for the mountain itself. So it's it's really really kind of tricky, and I'll show you that a bit. But I thought this would be the easiest part of the of the hike here. I got about right here, and I said, Randy, we got to turn back. <laughs> 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 I'm dying here. What's he looking at? I mean, you know, you think that, okay, it's just a nice grassy. But I mean, then you're going at least at a 30 degree. Angle there, and the grass is grass is fairly heavy, and it was fairly wet that morning too. He, I mean, you can't even see the top of any hair from the fog there. And for a flatlander, I mean, this is 5,000 elevation right here, and we're going to climb up to 6,600 elevation. So I was already starting to get wet. But, but I said, okay, we'll make it there. So we, we made it this way and got made the hike. And this is Randy in his expedition or pose. <laughs> <laughs> we're on the on the horseshoe right here, and there's the peak of Indian Carol oh, up there. Yeah. And what we have to do, we have to walk around the horseshoe and try to find the saddle that would get us over to the peak. And I gotta tell you, with the trees here, you can't see anything, really. Uh, the trees are very thick, and then all along the top of the rim here, this is the top of the horseshoe, you've got this volcanic rock, and it's, you know, it's all sharp, and there's plenty of it, and there's no real established trail. There's no, no signs or anything up there. And it's kind of weird that we couldn't see any animals either. It was, it was kind of like a dead zone. It was just really kind of creepy. Uh, but, uh, but somewhere off to the right there is where the peak of Indian Care is, and we couldn't really see it. That's the only thing we could, used to get a bearing on. So. We just kept following the horseshoe and kept looking to the outside for reference points that we had seen when we were outside of that. And then finally, okay, there's here's where we had walked all along this line here. And then we finally found the saddle. We'd gone too far and realized that we weren't going to be able to cross. So we got back and found the kind of little valley there and then started making the climb up these rocks. And you can see the fluted rock like you see on Devil's Tower too. It was created about the same time. And this is this is preparing for our final assault. <laughs> With the rain is going down into the little valley there, and then we've got to make the climb of similar rocks to this and get to the top. You know, George Custer came up here with five other guys and a horse. The SPCA would not. Like <laughs> I cannot see. I cannot see possibly how a horse could possibly get up this thing. But yeah, how long did that take you? It took us two and a half hours to get to the summit. Really? Yeah. That's amazing. You should say it's fast. It seemed like it. You know, in the whole course of things, it did seem yeah. fast. But, yeah, uh, nice. <laughs> but, okay, here's me at the top. And this is what I'm looking for underneath the rocks here. I'm pulling away the rocks. They didn't used to cover it up with rocks, but people started to do that. And I'm glad they, they had because underneath it, this is where in 74, George Custer had had his name carved into it. Oh, and you can't see it too well, so I use some drinking water to outline the letters. And that says 74 G. Custer. And uh, he either had the, uh, the engineer for the for the, um, uh, the 7th Cavalry or else uh, some other general carved it. He didn't carve it himself, but he supervised it. <laughs> Generals didn't have to do that sort of thing. Uh, but he put his name into it, and I said, this, I have to see this because you know, I'm going to have a fairly thorough travel guide. Travel, bleh, travel guide. I have to be with Custer Walk. And uh, I tell you, the views of it just spectacular. I, it, was, it was incredibly well worth it. And this, this wasn't a clear day. If, if the day wasn't clear, you could see Devil's Tower over here. It's about 40 miles away, but you had just, just an outstanding view. And this is, this is the other end of the horseshoe. One end of the horseshoe over here, but 
Uh, but people hike up there. I mean, they do it fairly regularly. In fact, I found the Tupperware container. Uh, people put their names in. And there's actually the well, kind of the program or Geocache of, of a wedding party. <laughs> and they had at least 10 people there, so I, I hope they tip the reverend very well. <laughs> this is murder. I, mean, it is, I would never go up there by myself. I mean, because very easily, you could take a spill and break a limb easily. And uh, it would be a long, hard climb to get back down. Because it, it took us two and a half hours to get down as well. You think gravity would be on your side, but it's not. I mean, it's hit your enemy because it's just forcing you down. It's, as fast as possible, just so, because the horseshoe's at about a 45 degree angle, and you kind of almost have to run into trees to stop yourself. Did you change your cell service? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. So I'm interested. The government really hasn't done anything about that decaster, um, where you find it. No, they're um, they just, the. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, exactly. Because you know, I was doing some research online before, and people were talking about how difficult it was to find that. You know, taking about an hour to find that. And as soon as we got up to the top, we figured out where it was just by seeing the cairn, you know, the rocks upon it. Uh, of course, then we covered it back up again. And I had to raise my my custer flag. When I got there, so. But uh, it was such. A, you know, I told Ray, I said, I am never going to do this again. But I, I wouldn't trade anything for having it. But you know, I kind of said, yeah, I'd probably go up again. <laughs> but no, talking about cell phone. In fact, I ruined my cell phone up there because you know the moisture in the air. Uh, there's this display on my phone that's just so <laughs> corrupted. I, I never could get it back. But uh, but that was that was one that was one of the highlights of the book. And actually, the covering about 35 different spots from Louisiana to Little Bighorn for the book. And this, this is my proposal for the, for the cover. I don't know if that's what Stack Poll is going to give me, but this is my suggestion. Because to tell you the truth, the last cover I thought was kind of flat. I would like to have seen a little more depth to it or something. So I, I sent them this and they said, well, send us the photos and we'll, we'll see what we come up with. They've got artists on staff and everything, so they, they do what they want to do. So, well, that's the preview of what's, awesome. what's next. Yeah. Thank you for the preview that you've been waiting for. And thank you. Thanks, Kathy, very, very much.